Hey guys, hope all is well. It's a uh, Monday evening. Uh, I figure I'd uh, check up with you guys and see how it's going. Thanks again for everyone bringing in their work. I've been reading them well and looks like your papers and summaries are good. Just remember um, a couple of things about it. Just make sure you're getting your covering the, what's happening with the listenings when you're writing your papers as well as what you're re reading overall from the text. Uh, moving ahead, so you guys are now finishing the Romantic period and we're starting to go into the 20th century and beyond. Um, our you know, biggest thing we sort of we cover in this class uh, for the 20th century is jazz and popular music, or rock music. Um, but we cover just a little bit of sort of classical music uh, from this period too. Uh, and I had you uh, listening to a piece by Stravinsky and a piece by uh, Claude Debussy, which is a French Impressionist painting. Uh, excuse me, a French Impressionist uh, artist, uh, composer. Uh, so you have the readings in place, and you can see here in our book we're in 20th century and beyond. You can see a picture of three musicians by Pablo Picasso. Um, the one thing you want to sort of take away from the 20th century as an overview is that it really was a period of extremes in both violence and progress. Uh, you know, you see in the last hundred years, you know, two world wars, Vietnam, you know, civil, you know, civil rights movements, good things too, you know, uh, different advances in medicine, technology, um, you know, and also, you know, bad things like, you know, holocausts and, you know, nuclear war and things like that. So especially in the earlier part of this 20th century, a lot of these sort of uh, things had given an impression to society that, you know, artists were, then you know, things were so you know, blurred, sort of almost a little bit, of almost like what we're going with now in a sense, that you know the artist tried to capture um, the images that no longer represented the visual world because th things seem so surreal. So we look at a lot of sort of abstract art, and you wonder if you go to like we go to like the Museum of Modern Art, or you look at these Picasso, like what are all these weird shapes and stuff? And it really, really was a reaction to what was happening in society as this being such a such a dramatic period that things just seemed fragmented and just didn't seem real. Um, and that's where you, a lot of the takeaway we get with uh, music too, where you have a lot more uh, dissonance and, and abstract, you know, the artists, uh, music, um, composers were doing different things with harmonies and, and, and rhythms, can, you know, sometimes can be very jarring, very experimental sounding, you know, certainly not uh, many, and many of course, not all of them of course, having such, such a sense of, um, just anger and, and aggression and aggression, but experimentation, because that's a lot of what was going on. So it didn't really quite have that sort of lyricalism you might have been comfortable with with the romantics, as you can see with Stravinsky, which is actually uh, the piece that I had given you. We don't cover, like I said, only a couple of things I show you just to give an idea. And you don't have to listen to the whole thing. You can sort of listen to some excerpts of it, or you can actually watch. It's actually a ballet, The Rite of Spring, which, as you can tell, is something you know extremely challenging to sort of choreograph. As you can watch you can watch videos of some of the choreography on YouTube as well. But I just I think I just had sent you the, a link for just the orchestral version of it. Um, but also there's been also really a lot of beautiful music too, like WC, which can be experimental too, uh, had done a lot of this this what we call like impressionism. Um, this if you ever seen uh, if you ever seen uh, sort of Monet or Manet, these French Impressionistic uh, painters, they sort of have this sort of washy quality. This is on three, my book's 370. You can see a picture of Monet. And so, what these guys were doing, sorry, it's a little dark in here, but you got the book. We're really, again, not sort of painting an exact replica of what they're seeing, but sort of creating, sort of um, you know, taking the picture of, a, of an atmosphere or a feeling about something, you know, how that particular day or that vision feels for somebody looking at it as opposed to, wow, this looks like exactly like a man on a boat. So that's what these sort of impression is. It gives you the impression of something. And you can see with, um, and then the prelude to an afternoon of the fawn uh, sort of gives it sort of this very sort of tranquil, sort of peaceful kind of um, vibe to it, as you'll hear in the music from that piece. Um, and, you know, in the early 20th century, as we talk about it, you know, some of my favorite music was jazz and really was um, some sort of something that was starting to, starting to develop in the 1920s and became very, very popular through the, through the 1940s. Um, and, you know, even these classical musicians were really inspired by uh, jazz too, that, you know, George Gershwin. 
um, some of these uh, some of these guys were really into it and had incorporated some of that stuff into their classical music. But for um, you know, sort of its genre of its own, you know, you can you know, read, what, what you can do is read that, as I said, that uh, jazz outline and give you sort of an idea of sort of the roots. And what you're sort of getting with here is def it's def certainly without a question an African American uh, origins. You know, a lot of this music had come from West Africa, you know, in the 1800s with the slow slave trades coming in. They had, you know, of course, brought their culture. So a lot of the music that you hear was, you know, work songs, field hollers, these sort of things had sort of developed as part of an influence on that sort of on the jazz culture. So you'll get like call and response. Um, you know, one person would say something, you'll get a response back. Um, then you'll have, um, you know, things like, um, you know, improvisate. You know, the biggest things you want to take away from jazz, and this is something that is again developed from West African music, is sort of a sense of complex rhythms, and then you have sort of a sense of improvisation. So the rhythms, uh, you know, people might say, oh, it's swings. You know, what is swings? Well, swings means is that you know the rhythms are going to be more focused on the uh, sort of weak beats. So like in rock music, you get things like heavy downbeat, heavy downbeat. But with um, these, these jazz instruments, you know, the, the beat's going to be, the, the focus is going to be on beats two and four. So if you had four beats, you know, one, two, three, four, your accent is going to be beats two and four. And that gives it the swing. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And that's kind of how, how that sort of develops. And then improvisation, which was, again, a big part of African culture, was, you know, something that, um, is really you're you know making it up in the moment you're composing you know, in the moment as opposed to sort of preconditioning okay this is how I want to solo this is what I want to play I want to start writing it out or something so these guys were doing um, doing it in the moment so that was some, that's a huge these are like the two big sort of you know, pillars of jazz is knowing it's an, it's an art form that uses improvisation so it's you know creating in the moment and having this sort of rhythmics idea and of course jazz it evolved and done many different things throughout throughout its sort of history, including you know, up till today. So that's sort of the one thing that you want to sort of take away from. I began the listenings uh, with jazz, uh, listening to um, Jelly Roll Morton and um, Scott Joplin's uh, versions of the Maple Leaf Rag. Um, this could, could give you a good illustration of sort of how you know jazz had developed. Maple Leaf Rag is a, is not a jazz piece. It's a it's a ragtime piece. And it was recorded in 1899. In fact, the recording that you're hearing is actually Joplin playing. However, it's done on a piano roll. So what's happening is he's playing on a piano, and it's punching holes in this big cylinder of paper. So then the music the, the piano will actually then play back with having him his sort of notation you know his notes that he played playing it back. So. It's not a. It's a crude representation, but you have to remember that the recorded sound had not yet been invented. You know, you're not getting any sort of the stylistics. You're just getting the notes. Um, but so you, so you get this sort of sense of what you know. This was this was like sort of an, one of the early influences of these jazz guys too. Was like European music and ragtime and things like that. They were listening to these this stuff. Um, but then if you hear Jelly Roll Morton, you know, who's playing the same piece, it may it, even though it doesn't sound very much like it at all. And this was probably around the 1920s or 30s, you know, and don't, don't go by the recording technology because again, it's, it's him actually playing it, but it's early recording technology. You can hear um, him playing the song, but it's different in the sense of two things. Again, he's improvising. He's, he's kind of just, he's, you know, working around the piece. You can say, again, hear the sort of the basic melodies of Maple Leaf Rag when you listen close, but it's like him, you know, fiddling with it. And the other part is you can hear that swing. So you can kind of sort of snap to it. And you can sort of, so instead of having this very military-esque or march-like um, rhythm that you hear on the original Maple Leaf Rag, you hear this sort of much more of a swinging feel. So that gives you really sort of a good you know, opener of like how jazz had, you know, how, the, how the whole genre sort of, that sort of came about. Um, the other thing that was part of your listening is sort of jazz and blues are very much are very much a similar uh, have a lot of traits that are similar um, you know blues music um, uses both blues and a lot of jazz not all, not all jazz but a lot of jazz uses what we call a 12 bar blues form uh, meaning that it's going to it's basically comprised of three chords in a particular order 
and then it's just repeated throughout, you know, however many times they played it within the song itself. Um, and the example that I had showed you is uh, to get started, it's going to be um, I'll find it real quick. the uh, here it is. Uh, Bessie Smith's Lost Your Head Blues. This is on my page. Is if you go to the blues section, uh, it should be uh, mine's Find the Texas 477. You can see Bessie Smith in a picture over there, who's sort of you know, one of those pioneers of blues music. And this is again another example of not a jazz tune, but it has sort of these jazzy kind of qualities where it's going to use this sort of form. And um, the stanzas of the song are very similar to a lot of what these blues blues tunes are. So you have, you know, uh, here I was left uh, was with you, baby, when you did not have a dime. Then it's repeated, and then the third line is now since you've gone plenty of money. Uh, you've gone and good and uh, thrown your good gal down, and then 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 the the cycle of chords will repeat over with new words. So you'll have this sort of variation. But you can see sort of the content of these blues tunes. For one, is just sort of these little sad stories, you know, uh, and which was these are very popular at the time, still are. And so you'll have this sort of, you know, stanza of something that's happening, and then sort of the punchline is at the end of it, um, as as Bessie's singing. So this is again a good, ex an excellent example of um, using sort of, you know, the blues stanza, you know, the the twelve bar blues form, and then uh, also you'll start to hear in this p version here also call and response and improvising. So Bessie will have this written out these words, um, and then you'll hear she's accompanied by a, it says cornet or a trumpet. It's the same, basically the same instrument. So she'll sing a part of it, and you'll hear a response from the. Uh, trumpet player that's improvised. So it's again sort of this call and response that you'll hear. It's an excellent example of that. Yeah, it's a very straightforward tune, so it's kind of a good way. Um, also with blues, I had given you a couple other examples, Lightning Hopkins and Muddy Waters, two of my favorite artists actually, um, and that you incorporate sort of, sort of different sort of subgenres of the blues. Uh, Lightning Hopkins is giving you an example of something, something more traditionally a, like a country style blues. Where it's, or it's more of a rural, where it's just a guy singing and playing guitar. There's nothing fancy about it. Even his technique on the guitar, although he's an incredible player, you know, is, is not like you know some classical musician or something. It's just very sort of very rural, but very effective. Uh, he's an excellent storyteller. Uh, whereas the Muddy Waters, you can start to see more of an urban style of blues, or you start now seeing electric instruments, bigger bands, much polished sound, polished look. Um, they had, you know, all these different, you know, the arrangements at some times of how the songs wanted to do. So those are sort of examples of you know, in interesting examples of different blues artists from history. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an early going on how sort of blues and jazz had developed. Um, so I'm going to pause this here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a part two on our jazz. So you know, in the first, so the first half is like get familiar with the readings and, com and get comfortable with sort of the early jazz. Uh, from you know these, uh, the beginning players, you know best, you know and blues players like that. And then I'll sort of show you something sort of that goes through the development of the rest of the jazz. So hope you enjoy, and have a good night. <laughs>